<clears throat> yes, so the topic for today, we are going to continue with this uncertainty uh, quantification and management. And we, or I hope that you, that we have enough time that you are going to start at least doing the exercise. And this exercise is going to be very similar to the one that we will be publishing next week. Okay, so I will really recommend if, if you have your laptops that you, you know, we're going to try to, s if there is time, to sit in groups and start doing this exercise. Okay, so what we saw, just a uh, very quick summary, last class. Okay, first that we initially have very little information and this information we just have a range. Okay, we maybe have a value but we say really this porosity that we have could be between here and here. This reserve that we have could be somewhere between here and here. We are not completely sure. But we have to take major decisions. So to go with the project, which kind of concept we're going to use with field architecture, what is the capacity of the facilities, what is the plateau that we want to choose, too many things. And then with time, we're gathering more and more information, and but then we don't have much left to decide. Everything has been already decided based on some information. So I have to make sure every time I make a decision here, I'm taking the best decision possible. It will be ideal to have just the best of the best. Okay. But we are not there yet in optimization of field development. So we try to take the best possible that we think with some criteria, but trying to quantify also what is the uncertainty that we have in, in, in all of our values. Yeah. So I told you that we have a value chain model that we start populating all the elements depending on which phase we are. Okay. Initially we are in the, initial, in the uh, business identification case exploration, pre-exploration and for exploration, we are here. And then all the other squares start to appear. And I have to get a, an expert for that. And then I told you that we deterministic, I know the range, okay? And I want to make, and then I have for each one of these squares, I have some kind of an equation, okay? To calculate NPV, calculate cash flow, to calculate um, uh, the production profiles usually have some kind of sort of equation or if not an equation you have a procedure you have a process and how then we do if the inlet to that process is three different values or is a range okay I told you there was one approach that is just deterministic I take minimum calculate medium calculate and maximum and calculate this is what we call deterministic. But if you start to have too many parameters and all of them have this mean max, you have kind of a combinatoric problem, but really that's not the best efficient or the most efficient way to do it. We try to, and that we, s we gave an example, we try to assign to these parameters some kind of distribution, okay? We try to assign, we know that it has to be between a minimum a minimum and a maximum, but we try to give some probability of occurrence of that value. Yes? And then with that, we will see what we are going to do. But you get, so we need to start the class today. We need probability distribution, or for each input, for each variable, in my development, field development process, and this might be, we are talking now about technical variables, okay? Some things that porosity, we can talk about um, um, initial reservoir pressure, okay? S physical variables. In my field development process, uh, it is necessary 
to uh, determine a probability distribution. Okay, somehow or another, I told you if I have, for example, a minimum, x minimum, and a maximum, and I have no more information, I can assume, okay, all of them have the same probability of occurrence. So I just make it flat. Any value that I choose will be the same, will have the same likelihood to occur if I have no information. Now I know the region, well, the region, the, it has to display an average value that should be the most, the most, that has the most, the high, highest probability. And then the rest has less, okay? So then I have another shape. And that depends how much information I have for my system. And also depends a bit on the expert, okay? If you have, if you ask Milan about probability of porosity, Milan is going to tell you, choose that. I have no idea. Then you go to Eric Skugen and you ask, Eric, please tell me what will, what will be? He tells, oh no, Milan is completely crazy. You know, I have more expertise, I will give you something like that okay. so that depends also on, on the expert and the way he interprets the 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 data available okay so let's uh, let's make an example okay and the particular example for that is going to be and i hope you you do it uh, it's um, a probabilistic estimation of a total recoverable reserves okay if you remember i think i already introduced the did we introduce initial oil in place initial gas in place no yes yes okay what is the symbol for initial gas in place g, g. g. big g and a big N is for oil. And the total recoverable reserve, okay, that's something we call, we, did we talk about cumulative production? Not yet, okay. GPU, that's ultimate cumulative gas production and NPU, that's ultimate cumulative oil production. That's how much in total I have taken out of the field or I have produced out of the field when the last person just, you know, turns the light off, okay, we abandon the field. We have nothing more to produce, shut the, the field down. And we can say this is if we want to make it more formal. Is yes. Is the same time. Is the integral from zero to time n of q, in this case of oil, in time dt. Okay. You still like integrals, okay? Maybe in a few years you don't like them so much. You have bad memory. But for now, I can show you an integral, and you are. You are. Okay. Okay, so that's how much I can recover. And then the recovery factor, RF, or in FP, SPE nomenclature, we use FRU, okay, recovery factor, is nothing more than NPU divided by N or G. P U divided by G. Okay. How much I was able to recover from what was originally in place. So those of you who already have some background in reservoir, what is the range more or less for oil in the North Sea? From the course of Whitson, I think he explains a bit. So this might go between 20% 
in Colombia, in one field that we were working on, maybe it's even 15%, very low, and it can go all the way to 50%. Okay. If we talk about gas, it's a slightly higher, okay, maybe 30%, but now we can be reaching 70 or 80%, okay. That means that I can recover up to 80% of what was originally in place, okay, just like a rule of thumb. And we hope we all the time, the people that are working with reservoir and in production, we are trying to push this bound a bit further. Okay, this one percent you s you think well is one percent, but you convert in money. What does it mean? And it's a huge amount. Okay. Yes. So we our example is going to be to calculate to make an estimation. At the end, what we want to make is desired output. It's a plot that will tell me the total recoverable reserve, okay? I have a minimum and I have a maximum, yes? And then I have, if you remember the graph yesterday, how was it? If you're the cumulative distribution. Okay, you remember? How was it? That we had one column that where we calculated the value by the total number, the number of occurrences. Let's go just show it here, I think in the Excel file. Okay, if you remember, that's the probability distribution function, okay, the frequency that we just made by dividing the number of occurrences by the total number, right? But then I had the cumulative that I made just by summing, just by summing this cell is equal to this cell plus the previous, okay? And that tells me, I told you very quickly last class, that that tells you if at least, so what does it mean? That 100%, I'm sure 100% that I will have operate at a speed less than 170 SPM, right? 80% of the times I will be working at a speed below 110. So this is very useful for reserves, right? At least I know that I'm 100% sure that I will have less than this value, yeah, okay? But we do it slightly different. Let me just uh, pull the plot here. Maybe I can do it myself. Okay, cumulative distribution or cumulative probability. Okay, of TRR, total recoverable reserves. And I'm going to have, I'm just changing the the I'm just changing exactly the same but now I'm summing from bottom up okay don't be confused but it's exactly the same in this case I was summing from the top down <coughs> but in this case I start from here and then I go up right and that tells me that if I'm here I'm 100% sure I'm this percentage sure that I will have this total recoverable reserves or less. Or I will have more, sorry, I will have at least these total recoverable reserves. Okay? And there are three main values. So this, if I choose here 85%, okay, or I choose 10%, uh, 15%, sorry, or I choose 15%, 50%, okay? And all of them I call P85, P50, and P15, okay? And this P85, I say I can be sure 85, with 85% 85 of certainty that at least I have that amount of reserves, 
right? And this I say, these are the proven total recoverable reserves. Okay. P50, I can be 50% sure that I have at least this number of reserves or less, these total recoverable reserves. And that's, I say, this covers the previous proven plus probable. And how do you write probable with B? Okay. And I have 50%, 15% sure certainty that I have at least this number or less. And if you see the number every time is bigger and bigger, which makes sense, okay? If I have something very small, I will have more chance, chances to have it. But if I start increasing the size, then I have less and less and less chances that I have it, okay? So this is uh, proven plus probable plus possible, okay? So this last part is possible reserves. And I have to have these three values. Okay? And companies usually based, some companies are very conservative and usually are based in P85. Some companies, they, they are a bit more adventurous. So they want to use P50. Okay? And maybe not so many people use P15. Okay? But you want to have the range. What do you expect from your subsurface? Okay? So we want, this is what we want, the desired output. Okay, and maybe you don't understand exactly exactly 100% how we are going to get it, but uh, but we are going to do an example. Okay. So the example is we are going to assume a very simple, if we have a reservoir, okay, oil reservoir, okay. and we can say that in a very simplified way you have oil remember we paint it with green okay we have certain h and if you see it from the top of course it looks like something like this okay doesn't matter too much the structure but you just that i have the height of a layer and then from the top i have a distribution of areas or if we we make it like this, okay, you have a fault or you have a ceiling rock, and then you have the oil layer. So we can make a legend here. And for example, we have water, okay? We have a, an aquifer. So we can say that the the total recoverable reserves or the NPU in that case, okay, is going to be equal to what? Okay. We have the rock pore volume, we are going to call it BPR, that's the rock pore um sorry, rock bulk volume. Okay. That this, if we assume that the area doesn't change with depth, okay, we can just assume there is a block and we can just say this VPR is just equal to H times A, right? The area, the aerial, if you see it, this is the view from the top. times h. If I have something that changes with depth, then I have to say that BPR, for example, is the sum of i equal to 1 to the number of layers of h i times a i. Right? I just discretize okay, in sections. But I can calculate this rock volume. Is the volume of the rock that I have of my complete accumulation of, um, of my reservoir, okay, the rock volume. That clear? Yeah, maybe you have seen that before some other courses, I guess. Yes, for sure, okay. Then we have times 
to find from all of that space, we know that we have porosity, right? Porosity is the ratio pore volume divided by total volume. Okay? And it's just the spaces between the rock that that's where you have actually the hydrocarbon. Hmm? Let me see if I have a figure. That's something very trivial, but just we can have some, you know, we don't use pre-made, too many pre-made images. So we have to put some color to the slides. I know my handwriting is not the, not the best. Hmm? Okay, then we have, what else do we have? So this is going to give me the pore volume. Then to find the oil volume, I have to Usually the rock, if you if you the rock has some water, some conate water around the rock, right? You have the other rock here, okay, and you also have some water around. So to just calculate the volume that the oil can occupy, okay, you have to multiply times one minus water saturation. Hmm? Yes, too slow. Should I go quicker? Yes. Okay. And then what else do we need? We need also net to gross, right? That net to gross is the G, the, the the petrophysicist. They run a log, okay, and then they determine which area might have hydrocarbons or not. Okay, if there is an indication, and then from the whole volume that you had you had uh, some net sand that is bearing hydrocarbon, okay, right? So I have these three, and this is in which units? So this is a dimensional, okay? This is also a dimensional, okay? So which units do we have here in the whole, okay? We just have volume, right? And volume has just units of volume, cubic meter, or we could use barrel, for example. Okay. But we don't, like you well know now, for by, by now, we don't report reserves in local barrels, because then we have to specify at which pressure and temperature they are. But we all the time specify in standard conditions. So what factor are we missing here? Formation Something that changes from local to standard. So that's the formation BO, okay? BO is if I have some amount of oil at a given pressure and temperature, any given pressure and temperature, and they take it to surface conditions, and we talked about this is 1.01325 bar, and this temperature is 15.56, okay? If we take it, okay? And then we say the volume here and the volume standard conditions, the volume divided by the volume at standard conditions, that's the BO, okay? At that particular pressure and temperature. Okay. So we divide, so we can have this not in these units, okay? But in standard cubic meter or in standard barrels. Okay. And now what else are we missing? That's the amount of, that's all of that is N, okay? Initial oil in place. And now we have to multiply times the recovery factor. Yes? So that's all my equation. Now, each one of these things has uncertainties associated. Okay, has a minimum and a maximum. Porosity, saturation, net to gross volume we are not really 100 percent sure and just to give you an example let me um here i have a figure okay so the area plus minus 20 percent okay this is how i'm getting an indication of the area by the drilling the geophysical data the cores okay might be 10 20 percent so you see the uncertainties just in the area. Then in the thickness, I get it by the logs. 
I get it by samples. Again, 20, plus minus 20, 40%. My idea is to try to reduce this band. So that I'm all the time going to have some porosity, saturation, volume factor, etc. So really, for each one of these, and of course the recovery factor depends on many things. Okay, that's even more complicated. Depends on many other things. If I'm in tight gas, if I'm in um, very heavy oil, maybe I won't recover too much. This case in Colombia, just recover 15%. Okay. If I'm here, the oil is better, then I can recover up to 50%. Okay, so what we, so let's say here we have one equation, okay? So that's one expression. That is that expression that we just use now. We have that expression and then we need input, okay? And the input is the VPR, pore volume, um, bulk volume. Then we have the porosity. Then we have the saturation. Then we have the recovery factor. And there we have the net to gross. And I get, with this, I get the total recoverable reserves. And now the problem comes that each one of them, I'm not exactly 100%, but I have a minimum and a maximum. I have a minimum and a maximum. Minimum and maximum. And I, what I try to do is to represent each one of them. If I have more knowledge, if I have an expert in each one of them, please give me a good or what you think could be a, a probability distribution of that parameter. Okay. Like for example, you have Milan working here, so he will tell you, okay, just use that. I have nothing better for you. Okay. Then you go to Eric Skugan and he said, no, you, you know, completely wrong. I will propose something like this. Then you go to Kleppe and Kleppe tell you know yeah I think this should be something like that. Okay. Yep. And you have now let's put this again. You ask me, Milan's going to tell you that, and this you ask Eric, and Eric is going to tell you okay use something like this. Yep. Okay. And at the end I say if I have all of that. I have that expression, how do I calculate the same for TRR? How do I calculate something like this, okay, for TRR? That we say is PDF, okay? PDF, PDF. Okay. That's what I want at the end. To get exactly the same and then I can tell the company, you know, this is the most likely value and how much I can trust in that value. What is my confidence using this plot that I have up here. Okay. So for that, we what is used, so first for the, let's make just a few comments. For the, for the input variables, um, engineers, and especially during this business identification phase, Okay, engineers use usually uh, a uniform distribution. Or you also call rectangle distribution or a triangle distribution. Okay, a triangle is very simple, it's trying to do something a bit better than the okay, than the uniform, you have the variable, you have min, max, and you have one value which is the most likely, 
the one that we expect to have the highest frequency. And that we call the mode. Okay. But it's very simple. All the rest is joined by, by straight lines. Okay. So to obtain that plot, there are many methods, okay? But one method that is that is commonly used is the to obtain the probability distribution of TRR engineers often use the Monte Carlo method okay. and sounds like something exotic so any of you has used Monte Carlo before knows what Monte Carlo is Yes, you know? Okay. No? Okay. So the Monte Carlo came from, it was invented by a guy, or there were some people using it before, using sort of a similar method, but not exactly the same. The first guy that came and defined it formally was Stanislaw. Stanislaw, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Stanislaw Ullman, Ulam. He was a scientist working in Los Alamos in the US and they were working in a kind of a, together with a guy called von Neumann. They were working on a secret project that had to do on the effect of radiation and the propagation of radiation, okay? Something to do with the nuclear program. And that was around 1940. And they really was something secret the, the method was very powerful and was like a big like a big innovation so they didn't want to keep it secret but at, at the same time they didn't want to say exactly okay it's me and this guy so they could know what they were working on so Ulam he had an uncle that he lived in Monaco and he used to do some gambling in Monte Carlo so that's why they put the name of Monte Carlo at least that's the myth okay that's the the, the popular story so that's how the Monte Carlo method came but after that, they published a paper much later, I think it was in the 60s, and he got credit officially for, for that. So the method consists in three main steps, okay? Final notes. Okay. Define a domain of possible inputs. Define a domain actually is not of possible but of of possible values for each input variable. Okay. And this involves to propose some kind of probability distribution for each parameter. Propose or find, okay? You go to an expert, you try to use the data that you have, you find information from similar fields, but you find proposed uh, probability distribution. Okay. After you define that, okay, you generate a random input for each variable using its PDF, okay? You assume a value and that has to be within the range and has to be random in the distribution that you proposed before, okay? Then what you perform is just like a very simple computation using that equation, using this expression. You assume a random value of these parameters, and then you compute this TRR, and you obtain one result. Okay. So that will be put in more formal. Perform a deterministic 
calculation using uh, here people we are going to use now just an equation okay but there are some things that require an iterative process for example if you are running a simulator imagine that now that's not just the calculation of TRR but that's the calculation of the production profile and the production profile depends on initial reservoir pressure depends on porosity distribution depends on permeability so you have this will be running for example a reservoir model okay. you can apply really this method to anything okay so that's uh, perform a deterministic calculation using equation or simulator or routine etc depending on the model available or the model that you are using like I told you early phase you use just an equation if you go more in time then you have to use something more complex okay? and then after that you and here you compute um, you compute the value of interest the value or values of interest for example, if you are in a in a, if it's a, a reservoir model, you want to compute the recovery factor. You want to compute the length of the plateau, for example. And then you repeat many times. Repeat step two. Okay, so one, two, three, four. Okay, so you go back, repeat generate the random input, perform a calculation, and repeat, 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 for many times, okay? And I think for this example, we are going to do 5,000, but there is, I will, I will tell you a way that you can estimate the number of iterations, how many iterations you need. But if you see, think of it logically, if I have many parameters, I will need many iterations, okay? We're going to use now, for our case, we are going to use 8,000 iterations. Okay. If you put more, it's more complex, Then, but we, there is a criteria. And then after that, after I achieved required number of iterations, okay, then I aggregate aggregate all results okay that means all the TRR that I obtain and perform or compute its PDF and cumulative distribution and then you will that's all okay S so simple the problem is is this step the, the, the deterministic calculation if it runs quickly perfect we can run 8000 if it's a reservoir model that has 1 million cells it takes one day to run you will have to wait 8000 days okay maybe you will already be producing the field finished producing the field close the key in the field and then there comes the guy oh i found the answer i found the best best of the best and that for what okay. but it depends really so let's put that also, is, that's an important conclusion. The applicability of the Monte Carlo method depends on how long it takes for step to complete. We are talking many iterations, never is 10, 20, no, it's hundreds, thousands, millions of iterations. So we have to have something that runs fast. Okay, so let's do it for our example. And um, yeah, we don't have much time, so I, I just am going to say which we said we're going to use. So I'm going to upload this Excel file. Okay, we're going to use just uniform. Okay. 
and for the exercise probably you will have triangle or you have some other fancy distribution okay but the idea is the same so i have rough volume here we are working in field units okay don't like it very much but yeah that's okay and this as i told you is a class exercise but we that is going to be very similar to and i think this somehow corresponds to the Goliath field, okay? If that's a pseudo, I think in the size of the, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it's the Goliath. So we know that the rock volume goes between these two values, porosity, these two, NG, uh, net to gross, then um, uh, water, oil saturation, BO, and recovery factor, okay? I can expect from 42 to 65. But now I don't have any experts, so I'm not sure which one is the best. So I will assume just uniform, all of them. Yes? Okay. <clears throat> so let's, uh, the expression for uniform. So the PDF for uniform. The frequency for a variable X uniform distribution. Okay. Fx is... X min, X ma, X max. Okay. And here the area is one. It's one. Okay. The area under the curve. Okay. And how does the so the way we do it, you know, if it's simple like that we can just take a random value between these two okay but as the distribution becomes more and more complex you we're, we're going to use triangle we are going to use something else then we want to use something more robust than just to be choosing a value randomly okay so what we use is we go to the cumulative distribution how does it look like the cumulative distribution just like this right A and B. Okay, so you have zero probability that it will be smaller than A. Okay, and then it starts to increase. Okay. And this we can just say that, so what we are going to do in Monte Carlo, we choose randomly, it's very easy. We go from, this is one, if you remember, the upper value, and this is zero. So we go and choose a random value then we compute that point, and then we find its probability. Okay. We go here and go down and find, use that value. And we're going to change, now the input is not going to be on the variable itself, just to make it more robust. Okay, it works the same if you do it for just the uniform distribution. But if you go and increase in complexity, this is a much better way to do it. So you assume a random value, zero and one, go and read the variable. A random value here, go and read the value, okay? And this we, um, let's say, so we can say x equal to x min plus x max minus x min, okay? divided by, uh, here should be one minus zero, okay? Right? And here you have this random number that is going to be, so I'm just doing the equation of that, of that line, okay? Let's see if we, maybe let's do it from, that maybe it's going to confuse you, okay? So we know that the slope has to be a one, okay? Uh, so y1 minus uh, this y, 0, divided by x, this b is x max, and this is x min, okay. x max minus x min should be equal to the random number that I'm going to use, okay, any random number that is my random y that I will call it just rand, minus zero divided by 
this is the value that I want, right? This is my x that I want. Yes or no? Let me just remove all of these lines that might be confusing you also. Okay, so if we choose, like I told you, if we choose one run here, a random number, then I want to get exactly this x. Yes, so I do just that they have to have the same slope. This line, the red line, has to have the same slope as this line. The line that is formed just by this random number and x and their origin. Yes? So here I have x minus x min. So that gives me that x equal to uh, x max minus x min times random plus x min. Yes? Okay. So very easy. I have now to, to so what I propose to do it in Excel, and we already run out of time, okay? But what I propose to do it in Excel is that you have here the input. Let's copy it again. And here you have VPR, you create another column, VPR, remember to put the units, are very important. Then P doesn't have any units, net to gross also doesn't have any units, SO doesn't have any units, BO it has barrels per standard barrel, and FRU, and that also doesn't have any units. So you create that header, and then in the first line you say, "Here I, I'm going to put a, uh, I'm going to use this expression, right? And I'm going to use Excel has a random function, okay, that generates a random number between zero and one. And I think it's, it has exactly the same name. I think it has, for this function, use Excel. I think it's called rand, or if not, it's called rnd." one of these two but each one of them each one of those columns will have its own x max and x min x max and x min okay that random will give me one value then i repeat in another row then i repeat in another row then i repeat so let's just to make it clear so here this column will be bpr is equal to bpr min okay plus this uh, random variable that we are going to call rand of BPR okay, times BPR max minus BPR min, right? Hmm? And I will repeat the same with this uh, column, the other column, etc. And then I just have to drag it. If all of them have the same expression, I just drag it 8,000 times. Okay, there is a trick also. If you don't want to drag it to be there until tomorrow or you are going out, so there is a way to apply it to many cells. Okay, three, eight thousand. Okay, after you have the result, okay, here we have to have one more that is TRR. Here we use use the formula that is TRR equal to. Um, P times VPR times SO times recovery factor divided by BO. I'm missing the net to gross. Okay. okay. I just used the formula. And then I will execute exactly the same analysis that we did last class to this group of values. Okay. And then you will be able to give me P10, P50, P90. And that's very simple, but that's the first analysis that you make on this phase. But you can apply it to everything, as I told you. Reservoir simulator, any kind of model that you have. Hmm? But that's, okay, so I don't think we have, you, yeah, you have to leave, right? Uh, we don't have enough time to do it, but uh, I will upload it on its learning. 
and then please try to do it at home we are going to come here on tuesday try to do it but also i want you you to do it maybe we put some more one more complexity that is tried with a different distribution for example triangle okay uh yeah and um okay so if let's say here we're going to make one last comment um So here we say the last step is execute or compute. PDF and CD for this column. Okay. And then you will have your nice distribution. Okay. Uh, if, so one comment, if usually Usually, Monte Carlo is, MC might be motorcycle, so let's just put Monte Carlo. Is non-practical for heavy uh, computation, for heavy, for heavy models, okay? For example, a typical example is reservoir simulator. Thus, uh, another method called Latin hypercube sampling. is used. Okay. Sounds like something out of hypercube. It lo looks like traveling in space and Star Trek and but it's, it's another just another method. Okay. We don't do random sampling, but we do a more intelligent sampling, taking into account the because at the end I have to do random because I don't know really how my output is going to look like. Maybe if I know that they are going to be I should take more values around this area then I have to take less points, okay? Because they are more probable. But maybe I'm testing many values that are here in the bound, and that's not really the most probable case, okay? But I do it anyhow. That's Monte Carlo, does it distinguish. Latin hypercube, I have a better way to do the sampling. We are not going to cover it in class. It's going to be too much, but uh, I encourage you if you're interested, I think there is a, a course where they teach it. I will give it next here at Entenu. Is a professor called Radar Bradbolt. I think he's teaching it. Or if not, you can go on YouTube and you learn it yourself. It's really also very useful to learn. Okay. So before we close, um, today we said quantification of uncertainty using probability distribution. And first they have to create, uh, we did for a particular example that was probabilistic estimation of total recoverable reserves, NPU or GPU. And you saw more or less how is the procedure. First, we have to find a distribution for each variable, and then we have to run multiple times with Monte Carlo, thousand times, hundred uh, million times. Okay? And then you execute the frequency analysis on the output. Okay? Any question before we close? Okay, so if any of you, not to force you, but if any of you on that list doesn't want to be, so just send me an email. You don't have to tell me face to face. Just send me an email and I will come back next class, okay? But um, I appreciate your, your, your help. Okay, see you. Have a nice weekend.